This is a great segue. Uh, thank you very much for the other introduction. You can see it, uh, it, it'll work perfectly. Um, so just disclosure-wise, um, I, I do training and consulting for both of the companies that have uh, lumbar discs. So it's, it's funny because uh, Thursday was the 18th anniversary of the first pro disc um, in the US. And that was uh, um, me and uh, Bart Sachs is back there and there's my access surgeon and that's Terry Marnay. So Terry came over for the first one. So it's 18 full years, you know, in our hands um, of, of seeing proteus gals. And I see these patients back not um, infrequently with other issues. That was, that was Terry during the same case. Um, or they bring their kids. You know, their, their kids are now teenagers, you know, with like uh, uh, pars fractures from high school sports. Um, but I'm going to show you the best cumulative scientific evidence uh, of anything that we put in the body. If you think about it, um, nothing else. You know, artificial hips and knees never had to go through uh, repeated multicenter prospective randomized trials, intraocular lenses, cardiac implants. But the stuff that goes in all the time has never been subjected to anything close to the scientific scrutiny that we've put these lumbar artificial discs to. And still, like Rodney Dangerfield, um, you know, they don't get a lot of respect. I, you know, we kind of, we were consistently getting chipped at by not only insurance companies and the government, but also from, you know, surgeons who are still skeptical about it and think it's, uh, it's the devil's work. Um, so here's, you know, our clinical experience at TBI is really strong. The, here the light blues are uh, cervicals um, and the dark reds are lumbar. So at the beginning when there was just lumbars around, we did like a lot of lumbars and you could see it kind of dropped off um, when insurance reimbursements uh, fell and it stayed at a pretty high rate. We've done, uh, this is only through 2018. So we've done, you know, well over 2,000 lumbar implants in our institution. We reported on our first consecutive 1,700. I told you there were 17 anterior revisions. We've uh, uh, reported that. Um, and we've done, uh, you know, about 1,500 cervicals by now. So we've done a lot. Three of us have drunk, you know, drank the Kool-Aid really early. Um, so, you know, I'm talking from my experience, but also um, uh, some strong literature. The interesting thing is the older guys in the room will remember that before 2000, anything that got FDA approved got a paid for by insurance. There was, it was just, that was the quid pro quo. If it got FDA approved, you could get authorization for it. And it was, you know, we even remember a time when there was no authorization, but certainly an FDA approved device, there was no issue until year 2000, until um, the uh, Charité came out. That was when things changed. Additionally, in the old days of, you know, in the decade before I trained, I did a, a midline search, there were only six articles published in the, in the American, in the English speaking literature on surgery for degenerative disease of the lumbar spine, six in the whole decade of the 70s. In the 80s, when um, spine came out, the, uh, the, the journal spine came out, because before then it was just like JBJS and clinical orthopedics were the only two <coughs> journals. But in the 80s, in that whole decade, 50 articles on degenerative di disc disease um, and surgery. In the 90s, it had blossomed up to 209, and, and I you know, didn't do any more searches after that. But a lot of prominent surgeons, including you know, my chairman when I was in the 80s, said any surgeon who does more than two fusions a year for back pain should go to jail. You know, that, was, uh, that was what his philosophy was, and that was you know, the traditional philosophy. And one of the reasons was the literature was, was terrible. You know, it was a mixed bag. When there were publications, it had you know, grandma with uh, multi-level degenerative scoliosis, along with the 40-year-old guy with single-level disc disease um, and a degen spiny. They were all in there, and the results were never anything spectacular. But it all changed with these FDA studies because lumbar disc replacements were novel devices. They felt they became, uh, they were class three devices. The FDA said, hey, you have to study these in a really rigid scientific way. We want you to do these multi-center prospective randomized control trials. So these patients, instead of taking grandma, and instead of taking you know, people who had the PARS defects, and they just said, just find us the patient who has single level degenerative disc disease, who's failed six months of conservative treatment, who is significantly disabled by these criteria, has to have an ODI more than 40 or 30, whichever study. You find those patients, randomize them externally, and assign two thirds of them to get an artificial disc, one third to get a fusion, and follow them the same way for two years and come back to us and show us the results. If the, these newfangled devices are no worse than the fusion, 
will give you the approval. That was the deal that was made, so that was the, all the initial uh, IDE studies. So we collected that same level uh, and quality of scientific evidence on the artificial disc patients, also on the fusion patients. So you know, we, we suddenly got really good knowledge now of our fusions effective for this particular patient population, and now we know they are. But in those years, we didn't really know because our literature was, was not good. It, it just didn't help us support the fact that there's a role for surgery for disabling disease. So as Dr. Chamman very, very nicely introduced, what were we afraid of? What were the, the things that people like argued with me when we said, hey, we're starting this study? One was that it would be stretched indications. We had just come off this um, cylindrical cage rage with both the ray cage and the BAK cage that everybody thought was going to be terrific. Um, the um, uh, the uh, biologic people said to us, you know, you're like loading, you're, you're loading points on these cylindrical barrels. You're going to get into trouble. Nah, 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 the patient's doing fine. They were right. So we published a couple of papers saying, or, you know, six months and a year down the line, the patients, this was great, stand alone. They weren't. They all collapsed down. They subsided. They fell into kyphosis. They were non-unions. Uh, the biologists were correct. Um, so that was the first thing people said. This is going to be another cage rage. Second thing they said was going to be higher perioperative complications, because these thing, things have to be put in through an anterior retroperitoneal approach straight in. You can't cheat. You can't be off to the side like you can with an ALIF, where if you, don't, you can't get all the way over, you can still get, slide it in and turn it and you know get something done. These have to be done straight down the middle. The third thing they said was, you're going to be killing people. You're going to, these, they're going to have a lot of revisions. These revisions are going to be life-threatening or limb-threatening. And you guys are going to rue the day you started these studies. And the last one they said, they're going to be poor outcomes. This is ridiculous. You know, uh, fusions are what you do when you have a, an unstable or painful segment. You don't put in something that moves. So these were things that people gave us a hard time for. Um, so now. In, we've got the benefit of 19 years with the Charité, 18 years with the Proteus, to go back and look. It's almost 20 years where we can turn you know, the, the lens backwards and say, OK, what, what's the deal? So inappropriate indications for low back pain, the first one. Well, the insurance industry helped us out. <laughs> Not really. Um, but again, before uh, the Charité came uh, through the FDA, it was a slam dunk. There was no issue. Charité gets FDA approved, and every insurance company accepts that and says, we're not paying for it. You know, we don't, we're just not doing it. And this was like news to all the surgeons in the, in the country. The reason Aetna said OK is that they insured the 40 or 50,000 J&J &J employees worldwide. And J&J &J said to them, you know, you want that contract. You need to insure our new device. So Aetna was the only one that did it. Everyone else fought back. Um, and this was totally unexpected. None of us really understood why. So with no precedent whatsoever, the insurance companies pushed back, would not approve payment for this. CMS issued a non-coverage decision um, at the poking of you know, one of the, uh, uh, the academicians who wasn't even a surgeon. And we said, what does CMS stick in their head? And this is like you know, for 18 to 60. And they said, well, yeah, but there are some people who are under 60 who are on uh, Social Security disability through CMS. So we have the right to judge it. So we say um, we're not approving it. So that you know, allowed the indemnity insurers, like Blue Cross, to look at it and say, well, if CMS isn't approving it, let's take it to our tech committee. And they said on the side, don't approve it. So their tech committee didn't approve it. And that meant all the Blue Crosses didn't approve it. So, you know, we're like suddenly looking at this device that's been through an FDA study, and now we can't get an insurance company to approve it. So there was no widespread approval. It was only Aetna until 2011. And then in January 1 of 2011, after approving it for seven years from four to to 11, they suddenly said on January 1, it's now experimental, um, to the point where we called them and said, do you guys know something we don't know? Because you know we try to keep track of all the complications, and we're not seeing a lot. And they said, yeah, we're not either. We just acquired another company. Um, they are not approving it, so we just decided to change our policy. So they like did a complete about face. Um, Cigna con has continued to cover on-label single levels, but Cigna is usually not a major player in most markets. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield has started to come along. Blue Cross is a national company, but it's regionally administered. So some of the regions have started to approve lumbar disc. And, and Texas, our region, which includes Illinois for some reason, um, has been approving it for several years, but uh, strictly on label. United Healthcare was negative all the way from 2004 until September 1st of last year of 2018. And they now have a policy. Um, both Blue Cross of California, uh, Anthem Blue Cross, and United Healthcare all had class action lawsuits 
uh, levied against them, and they settled all of those on the eve of trial, agreeing to change their medical policy. So it took the lawyers, the hated lawyers, to actually get somewhere um, where, where we couldn't, unfortunately. Um, but despite all that, there's no data that shows that there's been an explosion of indications. There's been no data for cage rage, and the government and the indemnity insurers are certainly tracking that stuff, and they would have you know, blown the whistle or sent up a flare if that happened. They, there's no data to support that whatsoever. So the major deterrents to volume have been insurance approval, and then secondarily, it's surgeon reimbursement. Um, the reimbursement for a lumbar disc replacement is significantly less than an ALIF and very significantly less than a 360. So most surgeons, or many surgeons, have just decided it's not worth the fight, um, and they give up. They either don't want to argue with the peer-to-peer -peer nonsense and, and fighting with them, um, or they don't want to give up the discount. So that's been the second deterrent that is, you know, it's a little disappointing, because I, th I think we all should do what's right for our patients, and, and I believe in this, and hopefully by the end of the day you guys will a little bit more. Um, but those are the two impediments that I've seen. So here's that insurance penetration chart. Remember I showed you the one on cervical that is like, you know, ready to blow out the ceiling. This is what it looks like in lumbar. And you can see until 2015, it was hovering, you know, right around 20% threshold. Here's where Aetna dropped, you know, and then started slowly to climb up. Here's where the class action lawsuits hit. Bada boom, bada bing, bada bang. So it's now up to about 60, 65%, but it's all because of those uh, class action lawsuits. Enough patients got pissed off that they retained an, an attorney firm in LA who actually carried the ball and um, has pushed after the insurance companies. And they just served uh, Aetna about a month ago. So Aetna's on notice. And I think Aetna has the lowest uh, uh, ability to, to fight this because they approved it for seven years. Um, so there, you know, puts them in a little bit tougher spot. So hopefully they'll fall also, um, and things will loosen up even more. So uh, we, you know, stretch indications we didn't see them. The second thing were the perioperative complications. Well, the ID studies solved that because as part of the ID studies, you got to report every hickey every time somebody you know passes wind in the operating room. So you know all that stuff is tracked, whether it's important or not. It's all data that then has to get um, assessed and collated and sent back to the FDA to get FDA approval. So all that stuff is there, um, and there's there uh, has been no uh, indication that there's more perioperative uh, morbidity. Um, the um, perioperative morbidity of the arthroplasties was no worse than that of the uh, ALEF or 360, depending on the study. Um, longer term surveillance was mandated by the FDA, so uh, uh, J and J, um, uh, Synthes, and um, Esculap have had to report uh, five year post market surveillance on these. And again, there's no uptick in um, morbidity uh, uh, following artificial disc replacement. So um, that's two that we've been able to look back on and say it just hasn't happened. And we're talking about a long time now following a lot of patients. Um, the revision one was the one where people said that's a risk to life and limb. You are you know, causing patients uh, potential uh, death for doing this. So um, here's the numbers. The first 1,000 Proteus cases that were done post-approval were tracked by Synthes at the time. The anterior revision incidence was 0.3%. So three patients out of the first 1,000 um, once it was approved. They looked at a second pool of patients after 1,300 patients had been trained from 2006 to 2013. So this is over a seven-year period. The first 1,300 patients had, you know, obviously uh, multiples of this 1,000 patients. The anterior vision incidence in that large pool was less than 1%. And in the, one, the 1,700 consecutive patients that we reported, um, uh, starting with our first Charité um, uh, implantation all the way up to uh, the end of 2017, I think it was, we had 17 cases in 1,700 patients. So we're not including things like having to do a posterior foraminotomy or doing a, a facet rhizotomy um, or uh, you know even a fusion at that level, because uh, a posterior fusion, because those are not life-threatening. They're small numbers. These are the anterior revisions, the ones that you'd really worry about. It's really small. You know, I have a lot of partners who do um, a complex adult uh, deformity, and their reoperation rate, their revision rate is about 30%, and that's reported at SRS, and nobody turns a hair. 30 to 40% of these old, sick, 
medically morbid patients are being taken back for more surgery for PJK, screw pull out, all that stuff. Nobody says anything, but when you say 1%, oh, that's a lot of patients. Yeah, okay, I wish it was zero, but realistically speaking, um, this is not an operation that you, you have to not do because you're worried about anterior revision rate. So the higher revisions, also debunked, you know, it just hasn't happened, um, looking at a lot of patients over a lot of time. So the outcomes is really where things have shown. That's where lumbar arthroplasty really exceeded the expectations that we had when we first started these studies, because we didn't know. I told you, we had our fingers crossed. Kind of made sense, but, you know, we were plenty nervous about it. Um, and here's that arthroplasty publications uh, graph. Again, I showed it to you before looking at the cervicals, but if you look at the blues, despite the fact that things dropped down significantly, um, you know, around 2010, 11-ish, when Aetna dropped it, there's still quite a bit of, you know, blue publications. People are still mining the databases. They're still publishing um, uh, good, good quality, um, high-level stuff on lumbar arthroplasty. So the granddaddies of these were the IDE study uh, results for both Charité and uh, Prodis. Um, Scott Blumenthal and, and uh, the cohort of uh, investigators reported that in spine of 2005, and the Prodis team uh, reported uh, the two-year data in 2007. So this was just the data that the FDA used for approval. We followed those cohorts of patients out. Rick Geyer um, followed the uh, Charité patients out for five years. They lost about 40% of their patients because they couldn't get the IRBs in some of their sites to um, sign them back up for three, four, and five-year returns. They said, we only approved a two-year study, get out of here. Um, so their data is a little bit not as strong, but of the 60% they did, they saw no changes in the ODI and VAS from years two to five, range of motion was maintained, and their patients were working well. For the protest, we did a better job. We were able to track, uh, we were able to get every single one of our sites to agree to five-year um, surveillance on the patients. We were able to bring them all back. So this five-year database included all of our patients and all of our investigators and all of our sites. Uh, good follow-up rate, 82% at five years, and the same thing that whatever the VAS improvement was at two years was maintained out for five years um, with, with uh, pretty good follow-up. Um, the um, Active L finished its study, and this is its two-year data that uh, Rolando Garcia published in 2015. So between the ProDisc and Charité, uh, I think Mike uh, uh, Jansen showed you there were several other lumbar discs in the pipeline that fell out. Uh, the Maverick, the Flexicore, the... Um, uh, uh, what's the uh, Oreo cookie, um, you know, the one, the, the constrained one with uh, the Flexicore? No. Uh, well, not flex. That's, that's metal on metal. But uh, two or three, and the Kinoflex, metal on metal. So three or four discs were doing studies and never made it through the FDA. The next one that did make it through the FDA was Activel, and Rolando Garcia reported that. And then uh, Jim, you just reported a few months ago the five-year follow-up of that same cohort. And you can see the same thing. This was a unique study because instead of being randomized to fusion, they were randomized to an artificial disc. So it was surgeon choice on the control side of either a ProDisc or Charité, and most of them were ProDisc, but you can see, again, the VAS and ODI curves stay pretty steady from the two-year out to the five-year. So, um, you know, we get some comfort that, that these things are going to uh, kind of remain stable. Um, enough data of the level 1B variety has been done that now we can get meta-analyses, and this was a meta-analysis of four different prospective randomized control trials, three in the U.S., one um, is actually an OUS Scandinavian study um, that Dr. Chapman was nice enough to uh, let us publish in the Global Spine Journal um, that, again, is not just combining the data, but it's pooling all the raw data and applying different statistical tools to it. That's why it goes from 1B to 1A, because it applies sharper statistical analysis to a larger pool of patients. Um, so what about the risk of reoperation? Your risk of reoperation is half with an, a lumbar arthroplasty than it is with an ALA for 360 at a single level. Anybody, would anybody believe that 20 years ago? I, I don't think I would. You know, you think fusions, we know what they are, they're good and, and they rarely have to be revised. Only half, and this is all comers. These are, these IDE studies, again, at the beginning of everybody's learning curve, nobody was a super expert. So this is kind of a worst case scenario, um, but it's half, that's the, that's the number. You don't have to like it, but that's the hard number. Um, what's the likelihood that you're going to reach ODI success? And ODI success, either 15 or 25 point improvement over your baseline. Um, and you can see, again, it is significantly better than 
with arthroplasty than it is with um, uh, ADR, with uh, a fusion rather. Um, and here's the improvement in back pain, the same thing. It's not statistically significant, but it's numerically significant that the patients in these four prospective studies who randomized to disc replacements had better relief of their back pain than the patients who randomly got fusions. So the data is the data. And here's the, the patient satisfaction. Not important to the FDA. This has never been a primary or secondary uh, success point for the FDA. They don't care less. I care. You care. These are our customers. And this is what our reputation is based on. Um, and if patient satisfactions were terrible, none of us would be doing this, no matter what the rest of the data showed. Patient satisfaction is significantly better in patients who got disc replacements than patients who got fusions. It's indisputable. That's res ipso loquitur, as the attorneys say. It is what it is. Um, these are the, the uh, ProDisc L, just to show you visually um, how the ODI scores drop. And as I said, by about six months, it's stable out to five years. And the same thing with VAS scores. The VAS scores drop. The improvement's about 60% um, from baseline. And they stay there very stable out for five years for both the greens and the reds. So the greens are the disc replacements. That's what we're looking for. But on the other side, we also like track the reds, the fusions. So for the first time, we have good fusion data. If you pick your patients, you put them in this box, they will do well with a fusion. That's OK. So now we know that. And we can tell people who say there's no role for surgery and back pain. There is if you pick your patients right. Just don't take everybody. But for the right patient, it's the right thing. And what we were able to do is we got a, we got a small grant for J&J &J before they gave up uh, uh, the arthroplasty business. And we were able to track down about 50 of our 10-year follow-ups. Um, and we just had them do questionnaires for VAS and ODI just to get an idea of what a 10-year data point would look like if we could get all those patients back. And you see where it is. It's, it's good. It looks fine. So you know, if somebody's willing to spend the money to bring all those patients back at the exact same data analysis and x-rays we did before, we're pretty confident we can publish a 10-year you know, paper, and we won't, be, we won't be surprised. So one of the neat things we're able to do, because all this data was around, uh, this is one of the, the um, neatest uh, papers I've ever written, one of the, the neatest studies. Um, all the, the radiographic data was digitized. So every time a patient came in from pre-op all the way out to five years, every one of their x-rays was digitized and sent down to medical metrics. So um, the question we asked to medical metrics is, let's figure out a simple way to determine whether the adjacent level is better off in the patients who randomly got an artificial disc versus a fusion or not. So here's the way we designed the study. We said to the medical metrics guys, pull out the pre-op x-ray and pull out the five-year x-ray and, and scale, just, just put a number on the adjacent level using this validated system. So that's what we did. So all the measurements were made by the radiologist at Medical Metrics. You know, we had nothing to do with the surgeons didn't touch this data. Um, and all we were concerned is, is, is a delta, a change. Is it worse than it was before? So for example, if a patient had a one, if they just had an osteophyte pre-op, and they had the same osteophyte post-op, that delta was zero. I don't care that they have an osteophyte. It's, it's not worse. But if they had a two before, if they had disk space narrowing, and now they've got, um, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, let, me, let me back up. If they had a one before, but a three afterwards, so they got worse. So they, they had an osteophyte before. Now they got an osteophyte and the disk space narrowing or, or translation. So they got, a, they got a two. But if they had a two before and a two after, then their delta is a zero. So we're trying to just make it simple that is it worse or not? So that's what we asked them to measure. So what is that worsening in five years in all comers? The patients who randomized to a fusion, there was worsening at the adjacent level in 28.6%. In the patients who randomly got assigned to an artificial disc, it was only in 9.2%. Again, this is the radiologist measuring it. They don't care. They don't have a dog in the hunt, as they say in Texas. The difference was three to one, and it was highly statistically significant. So what we were able to do is we were able to cull out those patients we talked about this morning, patients who had absolute single level disease, a post-laminectomy, disc space collapse, every other level is perfect. We said, pull those patients out and run the numbers again. So in those patients where it's clearly just a new finding in a previously zero pristine disc, there were new findings of spondylosis in 23.8% of patients, but in only 6.7% of the percent of the patients above the artificial disc. Did you? Uh, yeah. Sorry for interrupting you, but did you look at the uh, fusions and the low doses there too? 
Wait, so you know, if those fusions were how much low doses you were achieved there? You know, and you know nobody measured that. Um, and these were 360 fusions. So these were A-lifts in the front and screws in the back. So all those digital, all that digital data is available. Nobody's really looked at alignments, either sagittal, coronal. It's all available there if somebody wants to make a life you know, work out of it. But no, we did not specifically measure it in this. So this difference is also three to one, but it's even more highly statistically significant. So that's a lot for patients who just randomly got assigned, you know, you get the artificial disc and you guys get a fusion and you get a disc, the next two guys get a disc and the next two guys get a fusion. So this was, uh, you know, pretty powerful stuff. We were able to look at the data from the um, active L five-year study, but again, that wasn't randomized to um, a fusion, it was randomized to other discs. So we just looked at range of motion, and just like that Jeff Spivak paper that I showed you from cervical, this is the first time we were able to show the same thing, that for every degree that we were good enough to give a patient, their um, incidence of adjacent level degeneration went down linearly. So there is a protective role for motion in the lumbar spine, just like there is in the cervical spine. Also, remember, two-thirds of these patients are at L5-S1, um, where a lot of people will stand up and say, you should just fuse L5-S1 because it doesn't move anyway. That's ridiculous to do disc replacements at L5-S1. That's BS. Here's the data. Two-thirds of those patients are 5-1, and yet giving them a couple extra degrees of motion significantly cuts down the likelihood that they're going to get adjacent level radiographic degeneration five years later. I mean, this is, this is as good as, as we're going to get. Um, health economics-wise, because we always said, geez, maybe that's why the insurance companies are holding back. There's a bunch of published papers. None of them shows that any fusion construct is cheaper to the insurance company than a disc replacement except for one construct. Patients own structural iliac crest. I haven't done that to a patient in 25 years. It's been a long time. I don't think many patients these days are willing to give that up to be cheaper. But everything else, anything commercial that you put in for a fusion, um, and it's a wide spectrum. I mean, it can go for just a little more expensive to three times more expensive, depending on your implants, your biologics, your front, your back. Uh, you know, fusions can be very, very expensive, whereas the disc replacement is the cost of the disc replacement. So I don't get it. You know, I, I always thought insurance was just a bottom line business. I really don't understand the, the pushback. Um, so, you know, we were, we've been able to show them improved function, early return to work, lower disability, improved qualities. Uh, you know, I don't know what else you can show these people to try to change their mind, but it took the lawyers to do it, which is kind of sad. Um, just a few words about complications. Um, and ongoing pain problems. And um, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. So if the problem can be handled posteriorly, if the patient's got a good functioning disc, but they still got pain, um, you know, inject, try their, inject their facets, see if you've overstretched their capsule, if they got some arthritis in their facets, if they do do rhizotomies. We've got some patients who had that and they've done fine. So you, you can treat facetogenic component to the pain um, afterwards. If they've got infections, expulsions, um, fractures, you got to go back anteriorly. That is never going to be a good result. Um, and it does put the patient at some risk. So avoid going back anteriorly unless you have to. Um, here's an intraoperative complication. This was, I think, in the Kineflex trial control um, uh, where they were doing a, uh, a pro disc. And you can see on this last picture that the last tap with the uh, chisel kind of knocked a fragment back. So the doc made an intraop decision um, to just re change that to a fusion, and the patient did fine. So uh, you know, do what you got to do to to do it. Um, here is a patient um, that I, I might have showed. Did I show you this? Oh, this is the one I, was, I thought I had yesterday. So here was a guy who's um, a, oh no, it's not my patient. So my wrong partners, um, so who's asymptomatic all the time, and just watch the progression. Um, his inferior components walking out. So the patient's asymptomatic, so now you got like, what do you do? He's not complaining, um, but just kind of nervous about leaving this in with progressive instability. So uh, they revised that also because uh, it's just not the right thing to leave it alone. Um, but here, it's a little bit tougher if the patient's asymptomatic, but you know, how many times can you keep taking an x-ray until you know, finally it's out and becomes symptomatic and then somebody's gonna say, you, know, you should have done it. Um, so here's a guy I mentioned yesterday. So this is a guy who had single level disease, um, pro disc. He did fine. He went back to Kentucky a couple of years, did good. Fell on the stairs going down to his basement and hyperextended. 
So similar to that case, he heard a little pop in his back, and here's the little tantalum marker. You see where it is? It's anterior to the inferior component. It's not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be uh, within the disc. So that's the guy I said, hey, you need to come in. I, you know, we gotta like do something about this. He said, I'll let you know, and um, some time went by. <laughs> Uh, he kept working, waited several more months, and then he came back, and, and it's still there. Um, I don't think it's moved a heck of a lot, but he's hurting. He's got back pain. Um, so he finally uh, got back to Texas, and, and rather than uh, do a big anterior operation, I just put pedicle screws behind to stabilize it. I'm not, not concerned about you know, that small amount of uh, anterior migration because it's stable, and this should help his back pain, and the morbidity obviously is a lot less than um, doing more anterior surgery. So, um, so what are the future directions? Well, we're getting some new diagnostic stuff that's in the works. Um, I'm a, a PI for a company called Nosa which is an MRI scanner. Um, it's technology that came out years and years ago out of UC San Francisco, but it can sniff out like lactic acid in, on an MRI scan in a disk space. And Matt Gornett actually published showing that that correlates with back pain, the, the, the disproportion of the lactic acid to proteoglycan. So we're, they're starting a multi-center study, and maybe that will take the place of discograms. It'll be a non-invasive way to um, select out painful degenerative discs from non-painful degenerative discs. And there are other things that are coming also that may help the diagnosis be a little bit better. Um, you know, new frontiers for research, new materials and designs, new viscoelastic implants, other discs that will more closely mimic what um, Mother Nature gave us. Um, we, Rick Geyer thinks there's going to be a role at some point for use of motion protective devices at the extremes of long fusion implants, uh, maybe take care of some PJK issues or progression issues. He thinks we're missing the boat, not looking at that. There may be places for different implants at L5-S1 that are more protective of the SI joint than others. Don't know. You know we're just at the infancy of this technology. Um, there may be specific level implant designs. Maybe it's going to turn out somebody's design is better at a 5-1 than it is at a 4-5, uh, or someone will come out with one that's better at one level or the other. And the last is arthroplasty in high-demand patients, in athletes um, or in military. You know, um, these uh, implants we have now are battle-tested. The military uses them a lot. When I teach these at military bases, they all pull me in the corner and show me pictures, you know, the stuff that they, uh, they, they can't really talk about. But at the military meetings, they do. So the military sends these guys back with cervical discs and single level lumbar discs. The only ones that the things they don't are the uh, jet pilots because they're worried about the, uh, actually it's the ejection, uh, the seat ejections that they're worried about. Um, but they are battle tested. So my weekend warrior patients, I tell them, I think we're okay. So um, I think we got really strong data. Um, the follow-up is good, good for everybody. It's good for our patients, it's good for us, it's good for the payers if they would only listen. Um, fusion in the appropriate patient is a good thing. We've been able to finally prove that and give ammunition to beleaguered uh, colleagues um, who live in, in different states. Um, both of them can lead to sustainable improvements. We've showed durability. Um, and the ADR clearly helps decrease adjacent level radiographic degeneration. And whether that turns into less disease or less need for more surgery in the future, we'll just have to track these patients. Five years is too small a window. It's really you know, 10, 15, 20 years that we'll know whether it really starts to make a difference between fusion patients and arthroplasty patients. And it's level one and 1B one and 1A data. And again, it's the best we're gonna get. You know, we, uh, we're not operating on lab rats, this is, you know, uh, track and clinical research on patients. So if we look at all the things that people threw darts at 20 years ago, we have really good numbers now to tell them um, 0 for 4, you know, th th that everything's really much better than we thought it would. And I'm just gonna show you this, Terry Marnay, um, who invented the ProDisc, Terry's kind of a renaissance man, so Terry, um, he takes classic uh, art and he superimposes more recent art, so he superimposed Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson on one of the pictures from our first disc replacement 18 years ago Thursday. And this is, this is hanging in one of my, uh, one of my exam rooms. So um, yeah, Terry's a good guy. Anyway, thanks. Thank you very much. And hopefully drank some Kool-Aid. Hey, yeah, any questions, please? For both the cervicals and the lumbars, what is your post-operative regimen? When you show to the arm, you know, when, when do you let the laborer go back? How long do you protect them, both cervical and lumbar, before you let them just fly? Uh, yeah, the universal, I mean, everyone in the world has kind of agreed that at three months, they can do whatever level they rehab to. So we don't worry about the disc replacement anymore at three months. 
um, earlier than that, depending, you know, cervicals, I'll send them back a little bit earlier, six or eight weeks if they're doing well. Lumbars, I usually try to keep them from really heavy lifting and repetitive stuff as close to three months as I can. Um, so I usually try to keep them out um, a couple of weeks, send them back to clerical work at two to four, um, to light duty uh, at four to six weeks until 10 to 12 weeks and then let them go. But um, I start therapy usually about five or six weeks, start therapy and have them ramp up from six to 12. Any difference in the therapy you do? Any difference in the therapy that you do? And you also said that you put your cervicals in a collar for a couple of weeks. Do you do a brace for the lumbar? Yeah, we do. We put them in, a, in a, just a wide elastic uh, uh, brace with you know, pulleys. Um, and most of that is really for soft tissue healing because of their, their transverse cellus fascia, the posterior rectus sheath uh, that you've cut. Um, and I also secondarily worry about the bone metal interface. I still do the same thing, especially where we've cut a slot. Um, I just want to keep them out of trouble. And uh, again, people, some people feel a lot better very quickly, and men more than women can do stupid things. You know, women are usually easier to, to counsel than men. And the lumbar, you'll put them back to the start of therapy, you said five or six. Yeah, I usually start five or six. I have them walk a lot. That's the, what I send them home doing. I said progressively walk more and more and more. But I'm afraid, because a lot of our patients don't live centrally near us. I'm afraid if they go to a very aggressive physical therapist on the outside, they're going to hurt them. So that's why I, I just made it a general rule to hold off till five or six weeks. Thank you. You're welcome. So fair game. You showed a certain very prominent golfer, but without going into yeah. his, uh, that person's identity, the best golfer of our lifetime, let's just make an abstract discussion out of this, because your group performed the definitive surgery. What factors go into the decision in a super high performing athlete, like said golfer? and doing a fusion versus a disc replacement at L5-S1. Yeah, I think you still have to look at each patient um, individually. And this, you know, hypothetical patient's particular circumstances were multi-level herniations, collapse, foraminal stenosis, and, uh, you know, not the ideal, not the patient even off the street that you would offer a, an artificial disc to. So that was an easy decision. It wasn't a question of loading or anticipated uh, stress on the disc. It was just that that wasn't the right operation for that patient. Now, one other question, and that is, um, we have to get to Dr. Hofstetter because he has a time conflict. Uh, but there's so many questions to ask, and we may have some chance later with a little symposium. You mentioned diagnostics. And again, I've seen you guys, and I've learned so much as a resident from TBI. You had an exemplary psychological assessment. But as we go through the um, assessment of a patient preoperatively, A, how much can you detect and I correlate discogenic back pain, that infamous chimere of a problem, conundrum, and diagnosis with modic signs, A, and B, should every patient undergo a psychological profile, and what do you use for that? So modic changes and psychologic profiling. No and yes. Yeah, I don't see a big correlation with modic signs. No, and there's literature kind of on both sides. There is some strong literature suggesting that modic signs mean that it's painful, but there's other literature that doesn't, and, and my personal feeling is I, I don't rely on that. But I'm a, we're a strong believer in psychological evaluation. If you're act, operating on somebody for axial back pain, it doesn't hurt to have them evaluated. Some insurance companies require it. Cigna requires three visits for the most normal people in the world. Um, but our uh, psychologist has published several books. And one of the, the highest correlations he's found between back pain and poor outcomes is child abuse. Now, I don't know about you. I don't typically talk to my patients about child abuse. I don't have time. It's not my expertise. I don't know about it. He said that is one of the biggest negative prognostic indicators. He would pick that up, and he'd be able to say to me, this person don't operate on them, or this person needs some counseling, or this person's OK. They've had some issues, but they can cope with it. Last one, because I, I don't want to hang on. He's using a tool that yeah. can be applied to all patients, yeah. and it is a filter. Yeah, he's got some, some testing that's publicly available that he uses. Yeah, the psychologist, if you have a psychologist, locally, you don't know.